Currently, there are a baker's dozen vessels sailing the Great Lakes that are at least 1,000 feet in overall length. To many boat nerds, or even maritime professionals, these monsters of the lakes are simply called footers. Often today's boat nerds, freighter fans, or just ordinary tourists can see one of these footers up close at the Sioux Locks. A lot of lake boat buffs have actually grown up with the footers. The first of which came out in 1972. The ability of these vessels to function is rooted in the second Polak, which opened to traffic in 1969. This new huge lock measures 1,200 feet in length and 110 feet in width. Some may think that the new Poe lock inspired the development of the thousand footer. That's close. However, Thoughts of such massive versions of lake boats began far earlier, like in 1859. And those concepts were revisited in 1911. Just for fun, let us start there before we examine today's Baker's Dozen of Thousand Footers. In the fall of 1859, a man named Roland Germain drew the attention of the Buffalo, New York media with a series of lectures. He had a concept for a new type of paddle wheel, and by using it, a new type of steamboat could be born. In his lectures, he projected a theory that by use of his new wheel, along with multiple steam engines, a new, fast, and huge vessel could be developed. The Germain vessel would be 1,000 feet long, just over 40 feet in beam, and yet would draw just 8 feet of water. The proposed vessel would be a passenger and freight carrier with six Germain side wheels, three on each side and was supposed to be able to sail at 40 miles per hour. In the fall of 1859, he gave four lectures and drew huge crowds where every guest paid 50 cents to get in. That would be $18 in 2022. Of course, the news media of the day called Mr. Germain, quote, crazy, unquote, and did their best to invalidate his work. Newspapers across the lake spread the word, often exaggerated the size of the concept vessel, and then just scoffed the idea off. Yet Germain was awarded a U.S. patent for his new paddle wheel on April 10, 1860 just six months after he revealed his concept to the public. During the Civil War, the Union Navy decided to invest in Germain's wheel. Two Mississippi River, quote, ram vessels, unquote, the USS Vindicator and the USS Avenger, were constructed around the newfangled paddle wheel. Both vessels were constructed under the supervision of Germain himself, and they worked as advertised. Admiral Potter messaged the Navy Department stating that the new steamers were, quote, the fastest on western waters, unquote. Both survived the war, yet a minor collision with a civilian cargo vessel revealed a flaw in the system. The collision damaged one of the Avengers' wheels. As it turned out, the wheel's mechanism was so complicated that repair took a great deal of time. Thus, they were no longer considered for use by the Navy. Roland Germain the Visionary was born on June 25, 1810, and he died in a horrific train accident 
on February 6, 1871. That was about two years after both the Vindicator and the Avenger were scrapped. Aside from channel depth, one of the key limiting items of a vessel's length on the Great Lakes soon became the size that could be passed through the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. In 1891, the original Poe lock was opened. It measured 800 feet long, 100 feet wide, but had only a depth of 16 feet. That depth restriction would limit the loads carried to and from Lake Superior. That is, until the Davis Lock was opened. The way forward for the Davis Lock came on March 2, 1907, with the clearing of legal issues and political red tape. Plans for the new Davis Lock were approved on March 10, 1911, and revised one year later. The lock was planned to be 1,350 feet long, 80 feet wide, and have a depth of 24 feet. In the fall of 1911, Sioux Lock Superintendent L.C. Sabin told the news media that the new lock could easily accommodate vessels as much as 1,200 feet in length and 78 feet in beam. This comment set off a firestorm among lake captains. For example, Captain John Tower of the steamer James Reed spoke to the media stating that the present 600 footers were, quote, unwieldy and difficult to turn in a storm. He went on to say, talk about 1,200 footers is foolish. Sixty years later, the foolishness pretty much became a reality. It began with the replacement of the old Poe lock. From 1961 to 1968, construction went on for the new Poe lock. It measured 1,200 feet long, 110 feet wide, with a depth of 35 feet. On October 31st, 1968, the Philip R. Clark from U.S. Steel became the first vessel to pass through the new Poe Lock. She repeated the process on June 26, 1969 for the official grand opening of the Poe Lock. Of course, the coming of a new huge lock led to a new huge breed of lake boats. On the second day of May 1972, the ore boat that Sabin had imagined back in 1911 entered the Detroit River, upbound for the first time. Her name was the Stuart J. Court, and she measured 1,000 feet in length, 105 feet in beam, and 49 feet in depth. She proudly sported the stack markings of the Bethlehem Steel Company. Although she was later acquired by the Interlake Steamship Company, she has always been adorned with a huge number one on her aft deck house, boasting the fact that she was the first ever thousand footer. She is also the only footer constructed with the traditional pilot house forward profile. She was followed a year later by the Presque Isle. This footer is actually an integrated tug-barge combination. She came out hauling for Lytton Great Lakes, but she was sold to the U.S. Steel's Great Lakes fleet in 1999. Three years later, the footer James R. Barker went into service for the Interlake Steamship Company. The date was August 8, 1976 and the Barker was the first to sport the standard footer configuration of all cabins aft, as well as a deck-mounted self-unloading boom. She was the first to have a flared prow and a stair-step after cabin. 1977 saw two new footers added to the flock. On June 7th, the Misabi Miner entered service for Interlake. At that moment, she was the longest freighter in Great Lakes history. 
by four feet. She was a near twin to the Barker. And on August 31st, the Bell River entered service for the American Steamship Company. Bell River was renamed Walter J. McCarthy on the 25th of May, 1990, and sails under that name as of the making of this video. Her cabins were designed in a very simple five-story high rectangular box with an elongated rectangular pilot house and twin smokestacks. She also had twin screws, as did all of the footers. Bethlehem Steel increased their fleet of footers by adding the Lewis Wilson Foy on June 8, 1978. She was a similar design to the Bell River. When Bethlehem went out of the ore shipping business in 1991, Obe Norton purchased the Foy and renamed her after their company, the Ogilvy Norton. Five years later, they went bust. An American steamship company purchased the boat, renaming her American Integrity. Just a few weeks after the Foy had entered service, the George A. Stinson was christened. The date was August 21st, 1978. She made her maiden voyage on October 14th and was a similar design to the Barker. Going through more owners, subcontractors, and assorted handoffs than any footer deserved, the Stinson finally ended up in the American Steamship Company colors. She was renamed American Spirit in 2004 and sails under that moniker as of the making of this video. The year 1979 was the final big year for Great Lakes shipping and saw the addition of two more footers. February 16, 1979 saw the Edwin H. Gott breaking its way out of Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin on her maiden voyage for the United States Steel Company. Additionally, her prow was capped with an extended edge which gave her a unique look. On August 29, 1979, American Steamship Company added a twin to the Bell River to their fleet with the Indiana Harbor. The year 1980 saw the U.S. economy crash into a deep recession, and as a part of that, the American steel industry collapsed. Launched into that gloom in the summer of 80 was the Edgar B. Spear, sailing for the United States Steel Corporation. She was a near duplicate to the Gott. On September 28th of that awful year, the footer Burns Harbor made her first trip for the Bethlehem Steel Fleet. She was a twin to the Foy, and like her sibling, would find herself an orphan when that company went bust. At the beginning of the 2005 season, she became a part of the American Steamship Company. She kept her name, but had to be repainted. And folks, that's a whole lot of paint. Finally, on May 10, 1981, the largest ore boat ever to sail the Great Lakes entered service. She was the William J. Delancey, and she measured in at 1,013 feet, just 187 feet short of Superintendent Sabin's prediction in 1911. She was built along the same lines as the Barker. Sailing for the Interlake Steamship Company, she will likely forever hold the crown as Queen of the Lakes. She'll just hold it under a different name. That's because on May 23, 1990, she was renamed Paul R. Tregurtha and she sails under that name today. Almost as a footnote, the final footer came to work for Ogilvy Norton just one week after the new Queen of the Lakes. She was the Columbia Star and entered service quietly on May 30, 1981. She was constructed along the Bell River's lines. This footer survived the recession and the collapse of the steel industry 
but her operating company could not survive bad management. On June 6, 2006, she became a part of the American Steamship Company fleet after Olave Norton collapsed. She was renamed American Century. She was the last of the footers, and it is likely she will remain so. Even with the addition of a duplicate to the Poe lock, which is currently being constructed, there is no economical reason for making more footers. Although they were able to quench the appetite for iron ore in the late 1970s, their size limits them largely to the ore and coal trades, which are now dwindling. Smaller, efficient, nimble lake boats are currently serving many of those runs. This video was only a thumbnail sketch of the modern footers. There are far more details to be had, and each of the footers has their own stories to be told. Would you like to see those individual stories? Let me know in the comments below.